Good morning. I love it when people say good morning back to me. It makes me feel like you, you want me up here. <laughs> it's really good to be all with, uh, with all of you this morning. Uh, our relationship, my wife Sarah and I, I'm Ryan Davis. Uh, again, we're missionaries to Cusco, Peru. And our relationship with Gold Hill Road began just about three and a half years ago. Uh, I'll be sharing with you more specifically about the work in Cusco tonight during the evening worship service. Uh, but we have been uh, just in love with the Gold Hill Road congregation ever since we uh, first come to know you just a few years ago. My wife Sarah is from Clemens, just west of Winston-Salem. And so we're really glad to have uh, a good group of people from the Carolinas uh, backing us in the work that we're doing in Cusco. Um, wanted to send our love from the Iglesia de Cristo Ayu, the Church of Christ in Cusco, Peru. Uh, we've got about 115, 120 that are right there, probably right about now, this morning, worshiping the Lord in Spanish. Uh, one of them in a native language called Quechua. So we have uh, your brothers and sisters half a world away, about 4,000 miles away, that are also worshiping the same God that you and I worship this morning. So just to keep a, a broad world perspective, uh, what you all do here at Gold Hill is affecting some people in a really positive way, half a world away. So just keep that in mind every single week whenever you're here worshiping uh, our Lord. This morning, though, and uh, my sister Chantrell back here got on to me because I didn't give her one of these Twix bars earlier, but um, we're going to start off with a little game. So if you do have a piece of paper, a little scratch note, or on your bulletin, get out a pencil, or if you'd rather open up a, a note app on your phone, something like that, we're going to do an interactive game to start off this morning. And I'm going to have three questions for you, and I want you to participate in this game with me. To start off, in this jar, I've placed a certain number of Twix bars. My favorite candy bar, I may be sending subliminal messages to those of you who might want to send a care package down to us in Cusco, Peru. Um, no, we can get Twix bars down there. It's all right. But what I've done is I've placed a certain number of miniature Twix bars in this jar, and they're all the exact same size, so I don't want you to think I'm trying to pull one over on you. But what I want you to do is I want you to look at this, and for those of you who can't see it well, this is the same jar on the picture in the screen behind me. I want you to take a guess as to how many Twix bars you think are in this jar. And we'll take just a, a few seconds for you to make a guess, keep it in your head, write it down on the piece of paper, uh, and then we'll move on to question number two. All right, now that everybody's had a little bit of time to make their guess, you guys wanna know how many Twix bars are in the jar? I'm not going to bring them to the winner. I'm sorry. I've got to use this next week. <laughs> there are exactly 41 Twix bars in the jar. Now, how many of y'all got close to that number? Raise your hand. Keep your hand up if you're within 10 of that number, within five of that number. All right, you can put your hands down. Y'all are way better at this than I am. I just try to get up here without eating them all um, <laughs> every single week. So whenever I did this in Cusco, I used much cheaper candy, and uh, I gave it away. So y'all are getting the sour end of the deal. But... 41 Twix bars in this jar right here, and I'll leave that here. I don't think it'll fall over. Second question in our game this morning, and if you want, you can write down this answer as well. I want you to answer this question. Who is your favorite musical artist? Who is your favorite solo artist, your favorite group, whatever you want? Put down the name of your favorite artist. All right, now that everybody's had just a few seconds to write down their answer to that question, I'm going to share with you the correct answers to this question. <laughs> if you wrote down Coldplay, James Bay, or Leon Bridges, or any number of others that I personally like, then you are 100% correct. Otherwise, I'm sorry you've lost the game. No chance for Twix bars. <laughs> if you've written down the answer to that question that's other than what you see on the board up here, that's exactly wrong. So that's where we stand here. But that's not really a fair question, is it? When it comes to talking about somebody's favorite musical artist, that's a matter of personal preference. It's an opinion. So that brings us to the final question of our game, and I want you to answer this one as well. When you decide what to believe in terms of your faith, is that process more like determining the number of Twix bars in the jar or more like choosing your favorite singer? Now, some people are going to tell you that choosing your faith is more like choosing your favorite singer. They say it should be based on your personal preferences, what feels right to you in that moment. But some people say, on the other hand, that choosing your faith is more like determining the number of Twix bars in the jar. It's a matter of fact and a matter of evidence. And I wanted to share uh, this little interactive activity with you this morning. I wanted you all to participate in that because there's 
a disturbing belief trend that is sweeping all across the world, and not just here in the United States, but in our, and I can say this now, our home country of, of Peru, where we live in Cusco, sweeping all across the world, and it's changing the way that people fundamentally view the world around them. So this morning, we're going to talk about truth. And more specifically, we're going to talk about the concepts of relative truth and absolute truth. And just by way of definition, relative truth says that there could be millions of different uh, beliefs that are valid about any given concept that we could talk about. On the other hand, absolute truth says that when it comes to the facts, the answer doesn't change just because I believe that the answer is a certain thing. The answer is a fact. It doesn't change just because people have different opinions or different feelings about it. So obviously in our example, the number of Twix bars in the jar is an absolute truth. It's a fact. There aren't going to be any more Twix bars in this jar unless I personally add them to the jar. Uh, there won't be any missing from that jar unless I sneak one out while y'all aren't looking this morning. The number of Twix bars in this jar is not going to change either just because I believe there's a different number in there. Just because Ryan Davis may believe there are 50 Twix bars in this jar doesn't mean that there are 50 Twix bars in this jar. It's a matter of fact. It's a matter of evidence. On the other hand, when we're talking about our favorite musical artist or our favorite solo artist, that's a matter of personal preference. It's relative to each person. I can believe that my favorite artist is the best artist that has ever lived on the face of the planet, but you can also believe at the exact same time that your favorite artist is top. It's a matter of personal preference. It's a matter of opinion. And, and we can't say that a matter of opinion is something that I can say is a 100% fact in this world. So in this example, it's really easy whenever we break it down like this to see the difference between the, the Twix bars in the jar, an absolute truth, and one's favorite singer, which is a fact, is not a fact, it is an opinion. But the disconnect that we see so many times in our world today is that people try to apply this exact same form of logic, if you will, to their faith. <clears throat> Think with me for a moment about your own faith decision. When you made the decision about what to believe in, was that process more like determining your favorite singer? Or was that more like determining the number of Twix bars in that jar? <clears throat> Excuse me. That's to say, did you make your decision about what to believe in, about who to follow, about what to base your personal, your, your beliefs in this world religiously about? Did you base that on relative truth or did you base that on absolute truth? That's to say, did you base it on careful examination, based it on the facts, or did you base your faith on your own personal preferences? Our society today is changing very rapidly, and for thousands of years, society has been founded on the ideas that there are fundamental truths in this universe that don't change. But now this concept of relative truth is becoming the new world view. The popular thing to say or claim in our society right now goes a little something like this. We can't really know what truth is. Truth is in the mind of each individual person, and what's true for me may not be true for someone else, and that's okay because I want to let them have their personal preferences, and each person should have the freedom to interpret truth as he or she sees it. And that sounds wonderful, doesn't it? It means that we can all coexist peacefully in this world, and I'm not going to believe myself superior to someone else. I'm not going to be trying to force my own beliefs on someone else, and no one's going to be trying to force their beliefs on me either. In a lot of people's way of thinking, we couldn't think of a more humble approach to life. Believing in relative truth is, after all, the way that enlightened people should think nowadays, right? But I want us this morning, I want us to start off by considering this quote from a famous preacher named Tim Keller when he said this. He said, to say there is no absolute truth is, in fact, to give a truth absolutely. Think about that for a moment. To say that there is no such thing as an absolute truth is itself a statement of absolute truth. It goes against the very definition of the word truth to say that truth is relative. So in one simple statement, this gentleman, Timothy Keller, he takes this concept that is sweeping across the United States, across the world like wildfire, and he shows the flaw in this way of thinking because belief in relative truth, and I'll propose this this morning, especially when it comes to religion, is self-contradictory and it's inconsistent. Think about what the Nazi regime did in the 1930s and the 1940s in the wake of the Great Depression. World War II was waged in response to Nazi Germany's conquest of Europe and against the atrocities that they were committing against the Jewish people and other minority groups in Europe. 
The rest of the world reacted to the Nazis' conquest of Europe out of a shared belief in the absolute truth of right and wrong. So a number of countries joined together to defeat the Nazi regime, to restore order to Europe and, uh, and to Asia as well, and to put an end to the atrocities that the Nazis were committing. But what if? What if the Nazis, or the, the people against the Nazis, the Allied powers, what if they had taken the same line of thinking that we often apply to our world today? What if they had said this? Well, you know, we may not believe that what the Nazis are doing is correct, but what's true for us may not be true for them. So in the name of mutual tolerance, we're just going to have to let them go on continuing to, to conquer different countries in Europe and to continue killing the Jews in a, in a pursuit of genetic purity. Imagine the chaos if we tried to apply this same line of thinking to, to our society today. If we tried to apply it to laws and people could choose to follow or not follow the laws of the land based on their own personal preferences. Or for you out there in the audience that are teachers, if you couldn't teach your students what one plus one equal, because while there, are, uh, there is a group of students that does believe with all their hearts that it does equal two, there's a big group of students that feels deep down inside that one plus one equals three, and who are we to tell them that they're wrong? When we think about it that way, it's really easy to see how inconsistent and self-contradictory the idea of relative truth, of truth being relative to the personal opinions of each individual person, it's easy to see how self-contradictory that concept is. There's another preacher named John Piper, and he once said this. The claim that there is no one standard for truth and falsehood that's valid for everyone is rooted most deeply in the desire of the fallen human mind to be free from all authority and to enjoy the exaltation of self. And you understand, just like I do, that not everybody that believes in relative truth has bad intentions behind that claim. But according to John Piper and many others, we all have something major to be gained from believing in relative truth. If we say that truth is relative and that there's no one truth for everybody, we've essentially said that we ourselves are free to decide what right and wrong is. So then we could say this, that the belief in relative truth is a declaration that my preferences are more important than truth. God is truth, so then my preferences are more important than God. Making truth relative to each person means that we refuse to submit to a God who is universal and absolute truth. John Piper also said this, If God, if He exists, He is absolute truth, and we must yield to Him. We define good and bad, right and wrong, beautiful and ugly, true and false, wise and foolish, and our very selves according to Him and not according to us. And I love this at the end, God is the measure of all things and not man. When we believe in relative truth, we make ourselves the ultimate moral and religious decision makers. If I go out and I say that all truth is relative, then I place truth as I see it above truth as God created it. I place my own worldview above that of God. I take the place of God in that moment and I become my own idol, making myself more important than God Almighty. So maybe after thinking through this concept of truth for just a moment this morning with me, maybe you accept the idea that absolute truth exists, that, self, or that relative truth is self-contradictory when it comes to morality and daily living, but we're all allowed to think exactly what we want to religiously, right? We're all allowed to come to God in our own way religiously, right? Isn't everyone's way to God just as good as anyone else's? And if that is the case then why in the world are we as Christians even trying to take the word out to the world and change the beliefs of others? Why are we trying to persuade others of the same gospel that we have been uh, convicted by? But let's stop for a moment. Let's stop and see how this applies to religious belief this morning. And this is the part of the lesson that I want you to really focus in on because even though you sitting here this morning may not believe explicitly, you may not say that I believe in relative truth, I would venture to guess that just like me, relative truth has crept in to your way of thinking in ways that you wouldn't expect it. It started to influence the way that you interact with the world around you. And I believe one of the reasons that we as a church are oftentimes so afraid to share our beliefs, to share our faith with others, to ask others to study the Bible with us is because we believe what our world has been telling us for so long. And that's that it would be an intolerant or an unloving or an arrogant and judgmental thing for me to share my faith with someone else. 
Now, when it comes to religion and faith, there's one thing that we can all agree on, and that's fundamentally that all sorts of religions and faiths claim to have absolute truth, and Christianity is no different. Christianity claims to have absolute truth. In John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. And he says, Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Again in John 17, Jesus praying on behalf of his disciples to the Father. He says, Father, sanctify them by truth. Your word is truth. So that's Christianity. But other religions claim absolute truth as well. And we can take the Islamic faith, for example. Islam and Christianity, they do have one major thing in common, and that, that they both teach that Jesus was an incredible teacher and prophet in this world. But there is a difference in what the Quran teaches about who Jesus was and what the Bible teaches about who Jesus was. The Bible teaches that Jesus was and still is the very Son of God. But the Quran teaches that Jesus was nothing more than a messenger here on earth. There's an English translation of the Quran uh, by a scholar named Yusuf Ali. And it's in the Quran chapter 5 and verse 75. And it says this uh, verbatim. Christ the Son of Mary was no more than a messenger. Many were the messengers that passed away before him. So it's undoubtedly so that the, the Islamic faith teaches that Jesus was not the Son of God, but was just a human messenger of God on earth. And that's where we run into the dilemma right now, in our time. We run into the dilemma because if we believe that there's one God, and we believe that his word is absolute truth, then the Quran and the Bible cannot both be right at the same time regarding who Jesus Christ was. He either was the Son of God, or he was not the Son of God. Both cannot be right at the same time, and the thing is, we have to make a decision. It has to be one or the other. And we can see this same thing happening in almost every type of worldview out there. Whether we talk about Catholicism, Hinduism, Judaism, what have you, all of them claim to teach truth, but all of them teach things that contradict the other faiths around them. And what we have to face today is that the Bible is no different in that regard. The Bible, as we read in John 8 and John 17, also claims to have absolute truth. And if the Bible is absolute truth, then we have to react to the Bible's claim that Jesus is the only way to salvation. We read in Acts chapter 4 and verse 12 that salvation is found in no one else. For there's no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. And then we all know this one in John chapter 14, Jesus answered them, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And that is the most radical claim that Jesus Christ ever made. He explicitly says that he is the only way to salvation. He's the only way for us to find a path to heaven. So in just a few words, simply put, if we follow Christ, then we are rejecting all other proposed ways to salvation. Because by definition, being a Christian is a statement that we believe that Christ is, in fact, the only way. So either Christianity is truth or it is not. The thing is, we have to make a decision. So if you happen to be someone here listening to me this morning and believes that all worldviews are equal, that we shouldn't be judgmental in that way, thinking ourselves superior to someone else, that you believe that truth is relative when it comes to religion, then why in the world would anybody choose to be a Christian? Why choose to be a Christian if all worldviews are equal? Because it's certainly not the easiest worldview to follow. But if absolute truth does exist, the other side of this issue is how can we know what that absolute truth is? How can we come to an understanding of absolute truth? And since we're Christians, and since we believe that the Bible is absolute truth, I think the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Thessalonian church, I think he had a pretty good suggestion. He said this, Do not treat the prophecies with contempt, but test them all and hold fast or hold on to what is good. In the same way, and this is the wake-up call this morning, we shouldn't treat other worldviews with contempt, but we should test them all and we should hold on to what is good. And so many of us have been down those roads. We have tested different faiths. We've tested different belief systems. But when we came to know Jesus Christ, we found consistency in his teachings. We found the truth in his teachings. But Christianity and its claim to have absolute truth, they're not popular concepts in our world today. But why is that? 
If Christianity, in fact, does have absolute truth, then why aren't more people attracted to it? Why aren't more people baptized Christians in the Lord's church today? And I think that Dr. John Piper, one other time, he gets below the root of this issue when he says this. There's one reason why God and his church are so unpopular, and he says it's because they represent absolute claims on people's minds and wills and their emotions. He says, if God exists, we are not God. If God is true, then we cannot decide what is true. If God exists, we are not God. If God is true, we cannot decide what is true. It's out of our hands. We have no say in it. We have no vote. And I love this last part. He says, the universe is not a democracy. It's terribly old-fashioned. It's an absolute monarchy. Many people today claim relative truth because it frees them fundamentally from the authority of a universal God. If I say that we can't really know truth, so what I believe is just as good as what someone else believes, and what's true for me may be different than what's true for someone else, then all of a sudden, I get to decide what truth is and not God. All of a sudden, my personal beliefs supersede God's absolute truth. All of a sudden, I have made myself God. I have become my own idol. So relative truth. It's transforming the way that we fundamentally see the world around us. But we're Christians, right? We've tested all sorts of different beliefs, different faiths, and we found truth in Jesus. But since we're Christians, and since we believe that God is absolute truth, I think the key transition for us at the last part of this lesson this morning is, how do we as Christians relate to people of other worldviews? How do we relate to people of other religions? Because we do, again, believe Jesus' claim when he says in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. But how in the world do we respond to that? How can we as Christians be a viable part of society when we hold such an exclusive worldview? Doesn't that make us seem intolerant? Doesn't it make us seem judgmental and unloving to hold this kind of viewpoint? And what I really want to focus on right now is that when we as Christians talk about the interactions that we don't always have but that we should be having with those who are not in the church, with people of other faiths, I want you to remember three things, and if you happen to be a note taker, these would be the three things that I'd have you take away with you this morning. First off, God calls us to share our faith. And this is, uh, I, I always say this, I'm preaching to myself as much as I'm preaching to anybody else out here. Uh, I'm talking with you, I'm not preaching at you. Sometimes whenever we hear a statement like this, that God calls us to share our faith if you're like me in the past, you, or maybe even in the present, you have hidden behind the idea that God calls His church to share their faith. It's always in the plural. Sometimes I have gotten behind this concept of God telling the entire church to go into all the world and preach the gospel, but I don't take that as a personal command as often as I should. But this command was just as individual and personal as it ever was corporate and meant for the church as a whole. God calls us, each one, to be his hands and his feet, sharing the gospel right here on earth. Number two, when we share our faith, and it has to be a when, it can't be an if. When we share our faith, we have to approach others with humility. Ephesians 4.15, speaking the truth in love. We have to approach others with humility. And I absolutely love this quote from a famous preacher named D.T. Niles. This is how he described Christianity in one, one sentence. He said this, Christianity is simply one beggar telling another beggar where he found bread. We're all beggars. We're all beggars who by the grace of God found a life-giving source of food. The bread of life, Jesus Christ. We're all beggars. By the grace of God we came to know Jesus Christ and so now me as a beggar Having been found in Christ, I'm trying to get all the other beggars around me to come and see exactly where I found this life-giving bread. I'm trying to show others where I found this bread. So we as Christians, we're not superior. We're not enlightened. We as Christians are not perfect. We are redeemed. I'll say that again. We as Christians, we are not perfect because we have come to know Christ. We are redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. We're sinful people who are just trying to show other people where we found the way to salvation. The one thing that has finally made a difference in our lives. The only way, the truth, and the life, Jesus Christ. And third, 
When we share our love or our faith, we must speak the truth in love, Ephesians 4.15. When we share our faith, we must speak the truth in love. And I think so many of our brothers and sisters in Christ, some of us have done a lot of damage, myself included, over the years, because instead of sharing our faith with others, I've been shouting my faith at others. Instead of sharing the truth in love, I've done a lot of damage because I've been bulldozing people's beliefs. And just because we disagree with people of other faiths, and just because we believe in Christ as the only truth, that does not mean that we shouldn't love and that we shouldn't respect people who hold other opinions and hold other views in their religion. It doesn't mean we shouldn't love and respect those who disagree with us. But maybe this morning... You struggle like so many of us, like myself sometimes. You struggle because you don't want to share your faith whenever you're worried that other people think that you're judging them. After all, saying that others is wrong and that I'm right is unloving and judgmental and arrogant. It means we're intolerant. But as we close today, I want us all to open our eyes to the fact that oftentimes what we do when we're thinking about the way we interact as Christians in the society around us is we oftentimes mistake two very important concepts. We mistake the ideas of love and acceptance. And this is so important because I think this is where we really get it wrong sometimes. So sitting here listening to this lesson this morning, you may be one of two types of people. You may have one of two types of tendencies. On the one hand, you may be somebody who in the name of, of mutual tolerance, in the name of political correctness, you shy away from any kind of spiritual discussion at work, at home, out in, the, out in the community with your friends and your family. You don't talk to other people in a spiritual way that aren't Christians already. It makes you very uncomfortable to rock the boat. You feel like you're making other people uneasy to be around you. You feel like someone's going to think, man, he's condescending man, he's got this superiority complex. I don't even want to be around this guy anymore. So in the name of spreading the gospel, you shy away from it. And only in the most obvious moments do you even bring up your faith. But then you could have the tendency on the other side of the coin where in the name of sharing the gospel, you've stopped listening to the beliefs and to the thoughts and to the opinions altogether of your non-Christian friends and family members and coworkers. Maybe you have fallen prey not to sharing your faith, but to arguing your faith with the people that you interact with on a daily basis. Maybe you have fallen into evangelistic approaches that need a lot more love and a lot more patience than you've approached people with in the past. So as we close and we think about this battle between the ideas of love and acceptance, how do we find the balance in that battle when we know that part of our DNA as members of the Lord's Church, as Christians, should be to share the gospel message of salvation. And our brother during the class period and here in the auditorium touched on this idea earlier as well. But think with me for a moment about the relationship between a father or a mother and their child. And uh, obviously this is fresh on my mind right now as my wife and I are expecting our first, a little boy, in just about a month and a half. Um, so this is very fresh on my mind. But having not been a parent before, I think all of you parents in the audience will agree that no matter what your child happens to do or to believe, you will always unconditionally love your child. Your love for them isn't going to fade away. But your love for that child does not necessarily mean that you approve or even accept the things that he or she chooses to do or to be or to believe, especially if they've fallen into a moment in their lives where they're falling away and Satan is attacking them very hard. But this is your child we're talking about. Your child that you watched from the moment he or she was born, the child that you watched take those first steps. Hopefully he or she said mama before daddy to keep mom happy at home. You've watched this child grow up and discover the world around him or her. So you love your child unconditionally. So it is possible then that you can love someone without agreeing with everything that they choose to do or to say or to believe. Now we bring that idea back into the context of society as a whole. And we often hear, you guys hear this on the news all the time, in every form of media out there, that it's unloving for us to believe that it's okay to not accept everybody's different worldview and not to respect everybody else's opinion. But if we as Christians, if we believe that God is the only way and that only through our Lord Jesus Christ can we find salvation, that isn't love respectfully guiding others to the truth in Jesus Christ. So we absolutely can love, we can respect, 
And we can even coexist with people of other beliefs while still lovingly trying to show them the truth. Some see love and truth as being an extreme tension, but there's a preacher named Sean DeMars, and I love this quote from him. He said, are love and truth in competition? Absolutely not, he says. To love is to tell the truth about Jesus. And let's all be people this morning that show that love of Jesus Christ, not only by speaking about our own beliefs all the time to others, but by stepping back and by listening, by taking the time to listen and to understand the thoughts and the beliefs of other people so that we can form a relationship with them on a personal level. For any of you that have tried to speak to others about your faith before, you know just as well as I do that it's very hard to lead anybody to Christ if you don't establish a personal relationship with them first. And so it's wonderful this morning uh, to be here today, to be a part of the extended Gold Hill Road family, a church that does speak the truth. A church that hasn't caved into this notion of relative truth in our society, but I think I'm even more proud to be part of the extended Gold Hill Road family because you're a congregation that speaks the truth in love. And it could be that you are here this morning and you don't feel like you're a part of that. It could be that you're here today, and I know some of you won't agree exactly with what I've said today about the concepts of truth, but please don't let that be the end of the conversation. Don't stop there. This is the most important search of your entire life. So please, take the time, take the effort, tap one of us on the shoulder. We'd be happy to tell you about the journey that we took to find Christ and how you can take that same journey as well. This is one of the biggest issues facing our society today. So if you have these concepts, you're not sure whether truth is, is absolute, whether we can be sure of anything like that, then please talk to us and we'd be happy to talk to you more one-on-one -on -one afterwards. But if you're here this morning like most of us are and you're already a Christian, for those of you in that situation, I want to ask, uh, I want to repeat what was said uh, just a few minutes ago in our prayer. Please, please don't do like I've done so many times and let a message like this this morning touch your heart, make you think, make you analyze the way that you interact with other people. Don't let that message touch your heart for the next 10 minutes while you're still here on a pew at the church building. And then go about your routine, go into the world, forget everything about the calling that we have of Jesus Christ to share our faith with others. Please let this message touch you more deeply than that. Please let this message motivate you to find that one person in your life that you've been trying to talk to for so long and make the opportunity prayerfully that you can be the one that God uses to lead them to Christ. You guys are the ones that are here in the community. You hear the conversations that your coworkers have. You know how much this idea of relative truth is permeating every aspect of our society. You know how it's going from house to house here in Fort Mill and the area around here, and it's taking over the hearts and the minds of so many people that we love. And in that moment, when people start to believe that truth could be relative, it's the same moment that the Lord can no longer be the king of their lives. So I want to leave you with this thought this morning. When was the last time that you stood up against relative truth? When was the last time that you even brought up something very small in a passing conversation about your faith with somebody that you interacted with last week? Or do you feel like you're on the whole other side of the issue this morning? You're someone here this morning and you're, you're still seeking truth in your life. And if that's the case and you're here in a church building this morning, then I admire you because it is the hardest thing in the world if you're seeking truth to step into the doors of a church building and to find truth that way. If you're here this morning, you're still seeking truth, and in the deepest parts of your hearts, you're unsure if there is one truth, then I admire your strength to be here this morning because you are testing all things, and you're trying to find what's good to hold on to. You're not here by coincidence this morning. So if that's the case, please, please don't leave here without deciding to explore this idea of Jesus Christ and what he taught just a little bit more deeply. Don't leave here today without pulling one of us aside and talking to us afterwards. If there's anything at all that we can do to help anyone this morning, please come as we stand and sing.